Hi, Wild Alumni. I'm, I'm Mike Francis, the uh, managing partner of the London office. I'm also a member of the firm's manager committee uh, and a partner in the corporate department. I'm very happy to be hosting this edition of the Wild Alumni interview series with, I guess, a, a friend and former colleague, Peter King. I've known Peter for most of my career from when we were both junior lawyers at uh, different magic circle firms. Uh, when I joined Wild, Peter was one of the, the first people who actually phoned to congratulate me. Uh, it turned out he'd actually worked with Wild as a co-counsel much more often than, than I had. So he could tell me a lot of things I didn't know, maybe a bit too late for me to find them out. Um, when I first went on my, my first trip to New York as a Wild partner, one of the other corporate partners I was meeting said to me, it's so great we recruited you. I'm so pleased. Uh, but it would have been even better if we'd have recruited Peter King. Um, and actually, I like and my respect for Peter is so much, I sort of thought to myself, yeah, I agree, it would have been great. Um, but actually, 10 years or so later, we got to finally be partners in the same firm. Um, and that was great news for us and great news for the firm. Uh, Peter is now the legal director of Her Majesty's Treasury. He leads a team of around 90 lawyers who provide in-house advice to Treasury ministers and civil servants. He's also a trustee of, of several charities, including the Salvation Army. Uh, as I mentioned prior to taking on this role, Peter was a senior corporate partner in London. He acted on several high-profile deals, as well as dealing with all our, our compliance matters, and was co-chair of the Global Pro Bono Committee. So, Peter, thank you for joining us today. Um, it's very good to be with you. Thank you. Um, I guess my first question, maybe you could just briefly tell people what, what your current job is. I gave us a one-liner, but maybe uh, slightly more detail without breaching the Official Secrets Act. Yes, it's basically a general counsel role. And like all general counsel roles, it has two parts. Uh, the first part is managing a team, as you say, about 90 lawyers, about um, 10, 15 other staff. Um, and that takes up probably about half my time. The remainder of the time is taken up with actually providing legal advice. And it tends to be high level legal judgment sort of advice to uh, Treasury ministers, Treasury officials, and sometimes to other government departments as well. Thank you. Um, so, obviously, you had been in, in private practice of different law firms, actually in different countries as well but for many years. What, what was the transition like? Um, what, were there a lot of adjustments you had to make? Yes, the transition was, was quite brutal, actually. Um, uh, I left while as a partner. I think I was a partner technically until Sunday morning. And on Monday morning, I started my, my new role at the Treasury. So it, was, it happened very quickly. Um, and I quickly discovered that the role was going to require a much broader range of legal knowledge than I'd had in the past. So, you know, I found myself advising very quickly on litigation, uh, which was something I'd never really done in private practice. Um, I found myself dealing with a whole range of issues across all the work that the Treasury does. And just for the benefit of people who don't understand what the Treasury does, the Treasury is the finance ministry in the UK. So it has all the money. And therefore, the Treasury gets involved in almost everything the government does one way or another. So uh, the I, I transition... Guess. I mean, just to say a bit more about the transition, the, the, um, that was part of the transition. The other part of the transition, which I think uh, is, is relevant, is that um, I had been used all my career to dealing with business people, uh, generally senior business people, um, and I'd got very used to that, that way of working. Uh, and suddenly I discovered that politicians were a bit different um, and they have different risk appetites. So for a business person, Normally, if I said, if you do this, you will end up in court, that was the end of the discussion. No more would happen. Uh, whereas if I say that to a politician, a politician might well say, well, that's actually quite a good outcome for me. I don't, I'm quite happy to end up in court on this. Wow. Um, but were they, although the transition was, sound, was was brutal, were there sort of things from a while that you could take with you that were useful? Yes, lots of things. Um, uh, I learned a lot at while about um, about how to deal with a very diverse range of people. 
Um, I guess I'd done that for most of my career because I'd always had a very international practice and always dealt with people from different parts of the world. But the, the wild workforce is a particularly diverse one. Um, and, uh, and also diversity has given a, a huge priority within the firm. Uh, that was very, very important when I joined the, the civil service because the civil service is also a very diverse workforce um, and takes diversity extremely seriously. Um, and uh, I was very pleased that some of my experience at Wild could be carried into that, into that aspect of my work. Um, and indeed, I've been able to develop that a bit further in the context of the civil service as well. That's, that's great to hear. Thank you. Well, what about the other way around? Are there things you think we could learn from the, the civil service? Um, well, it's very interesting. Um, one of the obvious differences um, is the um, uh, is the length of time that our lawyers spend actually working. Um, so many of our lawyers are um, uh, they are perhaps the second career in the family, shall we say, um, and uh, we. We do important work and we do difficult work, um, but we have to consider how to manage that work so that those lawyers in particular uh, can work regular hours. Um, and uh, that means that we have to be very careful about how we deploy our resource. Um, that, that, um, some of that thinking, I think, you know, whilst um, uh, you know, I was a full uh, I was fully participating in the in the in the culture at, um, uh, at the law firms where I worked, including while where lawyers work very long hours from time to time as necessary. Uh, but some of that work on how to deploy lawyers in a way that that doesn't give rise to very long hours is something that perhaps the private sector could pick up from from what we do. Yeah, it sounds absolutely right. I, mean, I think the world is moving that way. Um, you, a while, I think I mentioned you were a co-chair of the Global Pro Bono Committee. Do you still get a chance in your new role to sort of do that sort of thing or follow causes? Yes, I've been advocating this ever since I arrived, really, in my, my new role. Um, I've kept on, as you rightly say, with my charitable trustee work um, with the Salvation Army and, and several other organisations. Um, it's quite difficult for government lawyers to do too much pro bono work particularly in the UK, because pro bono work often involves challenging the government. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to do that if you're a government lawyer. Um, but uh, many of our lawyers are actually involved in other sorts of volunteering, uh, particularly as school governors, charity trustees, uh, and in other sorts of roles. Uh, and part of my uh, role just more broadly in the government has been to encourage government lawyers to do that sort of thing, to see the benefits of that sort of thing for their careers um, in terms of uh, developing skills, which they wouldn't develop in the normal course of legal practice, um, and in terms of their, uh, their ability to, to have a broader and more rounded sort of life. Um, and uh, we've recently created a role of pro bono and volunteering champion for all lawyers in government, which I've been asked to take on. Fabulous. So good. Um, so a, a, a while, you obviously manage a team on a deal or a matter. Um, could be quite a big team, depending on the complexity or the coverage. But here day to day, I think, I think you said 90 lawyers or so you manage. Uh, what, any, any tips for people managing large teams? Yes. I mean, it's not... I do try to meet every member of the team at least once a year, um, uh, and, and I succeed in doing that. Um, but actually, the focus for me is on the four people who report to me directly. Um, and, and I take the view that if I'm communicating properly with them, and if, I, if they're happy, and they're doing what they should be doing, then everything else will follow from that. I think you have to break it down that way. It seems to me it's impossible for me to to care about the individual details of the work of every one of those 90 people, um, I would probably go slightly mad. Um, and uh, so I, what I do is I focus on that top level, that top level of people. Uh, of course, I interact with all the other people from time to time as part of the, the, the legal work. And a lot of the legal advice I give is effectively based on the work that more junior lawyers have done. So I will quite often be talking to them about their work one way or another, but I'm not line managing them. 
And, and obviously, you have a lot of junior lawyers, as do we. And one of the key things for a while is, is making sure we we develop the junior lawyers, look after them, help them develop. You know, not just legally, but in terms of you know managing themselves and their careers and client relations. Do you have the same sort of issues or same things to worry about in in, in your role? Yeah, absolutely, I do. And um, you know, the development of the careers of junior lawyers and actually also more senior lawyers is is a key part of you know my responsibility to make sure that happens. Either if I do it myself or the the people who report to me do it for me. Um, and uh, we we have a quite an interesting approach to this in the in government. Traditionally, government lawyers move around from department to department. They might spend four or five years working for me in Treasury, and then they go and do something completely different. This came across to me, I think, very early on. Uh, one of our lawyers was working on implementation of an EU directive, and um, uh, we were having a discussion about the work he was doing and a very technical sort of financial services regulatory thing. Uh, and uh, I asked him, you know, what he was going to do next. And he said, well, actually, t- actually, I'm, um, I'm going off to the Ministry of Defence uh, next week uh, and I'm going to be dealing with the system for prosecuting army officers who've done something wrong. And it struck me this was absolutely extraordinary. You know, he was someone who was deep into financial services, regulatory law, suddenly going to do something completely different. This is considered quite normal in government circles. It's a system which has an awful lot of strengths, but also a lot of weaknesses. So part of my role is to try to make sure we, we balance that desire for people to get broad experience in order to develop their careers with the need we have in Treasury to have people who have really deep knowledge of the quite complicated subject matter we have to deal with from time to time. Any particular tips or things you find have worked in doing that? Or? Yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of that, uh, certainly for the people I've dealt with directly on this, is around understanding, helping the lawyers themselves to understand what their career aspirations really are. Um, I, I would say this about my own career, actually. I think it's very easy when you're a junior lawyer just to let things happen to you. You know, you, you get given good work by a partner you like working with and you just carry on doing it and it all feels great. Um, but you don't necessarily have any sense of the direction you want to take in your career or where you want to end up, what sort of things you like and what you don't like. Uh, and often I found it's really helpful to encourage lawyers to think about those things and then to think about, well, what do I do that actually enables me to build on those things that I really like doing? So when you were at Wild, I remember you talking about, you know, the, the, I guess, the power of networking, the importance of, of collaboration, meeting up with, with peers and, and clients and developing your own networks in terms of, of development. Is that still a, a focus or important in your new role? It, it's absolutely vital in this role. Um, uh, so um, I, I guess I can give you an analogy which works in the, private sector context you probably thought in fact you and I have done this um you you have a lawyer on the other side who you know um and um uh there's a problem in the transaction in the deal whatever it might be you ring up that lawyer have a pri- have a private conversation with that lawyer and you solve the problem um the government equivalent of that is there's a dispute between you know, us and another department about money or about um, how the allocation of resources in some way. Um, And the policy people are uh, finding it very difficult to solve that dispute. Often it's the relationship between the lawyers that actually enables that dispute to be solved. Um, And uh, we do that regularly. We're always talking to each other. and, And the legal network is a very important part of the way in which government functions, certainly here. Um, and, uh, uh, and something that we, we value very highly. But quite apart from the legal network, there's also the policy network. So it's part of my job to make sure I am very well plugged into the senior policymakers. I understand what they think the, the uh, priorities are. Um, and of course, to hear from them what they're hearing from ministers, and sometimes to hear that from the ministers themselves. So I guess interest is still still important, but in in different ways. Uh, I guess not yeah. not as different as maybe I thought. No, not not. I mean, obviously not in the sense that we used to talk about it, where the network was a source of work. Um, yeah. 
Now, I, I think I might have said this to you before, Mike, but, um, you know, I always maintained a, a pretty good network among investment bankers, but I wish I'd maintained an even better one. So I would have got even more work than I got from them. Well, I think you did pretty well. Um, so I haven't really got any, any more questions. Is there anything else you would like to say about the transition or, or you think would be interesting for our alumni to know? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll make a couple of comments just generally about um, about the um, about government lawyers and about law in government. Um, uh, and I'm assuming people will be watching this in the US as well as in the UK. Um, in in the UK, a government legal position isn't a political position. It's not appointed by the government. It's appointed by the civil service, and you know we carry on whether the government changes or doesn't change. Um, uh, I think when Boris Johnson became prime minister, one of my friends from Wild rang me up and says, does that mean you're out of a job now? Um, the answer is no. Um, we have the job permanently. Of course, in the US, a lot of the senior government legal positions like mine, the general counsel to the treasury effectively, is are political appointments. Um, so they change when the president changes. Um, uh, and, and that gives rise to the so-called revolving door, where people who have worked in government end up in law firms and vice versa, they go back from law firms to government. We don't really have that here. Um, and to be honest, it, it's something that um, we'd like to see a bit more of, actually. We would like to see more traffic between the private sector and the government sector, because um, when there's a big divide between the two, uh, we don't learn from each other. And there is a huge amount we can learn from each other. Great, thank you. So thank you, Peter. That's been really interesting. Um, thank you for taking your time off and for participating. Uh, you're, you're clearly well remembered and fondly remembered the legacy you've left a while in London, particularly on you know the pro bono side and the other things you've helped us with. Uh, we still miss you, and it sounds like you're creating the same legacy in in government. So thank you very much for your time. No problem at all. Great to do it.